this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to work on three parts. The first part of today's session will be on how do we hold space and we in our meditation, I included space. So the meditation that we did will make sense to you as we go through this time together. So how do we hold space for the pain and suffering of people of color? We will also talk about how we decrease biases in our internal dialogue. And then in our third part, we will talk about how to listen to disagreement with openness. So as you have heard so far, we're talking a lot about listening, openness, space. And first let's go and, uh, and notice some uh, common understanding or let's have a foundation. So most of, uh, most of you perhaps have heard of the Four Noble Truths. Anybody has not? You can just simply wave if you haven't. Okay, you have. I, I knew this group would. But let's just, you know, just for the purpose of, um, of being open and looking at how could this, these noble truths apply to wise speech or skillful speech, our topic today. So the first novel truth, they're suffering. And as spiritual practitioners, how do we listen to that suffering? How do we talk about that suffering? How can we acknowledge in our conversations that there is suffering? If we're going to become mature spiritual practitioners, we need to acknowledge that there is suffering and we need to be mindful as to how we communicate about suffering and how we listen to suffering. The source of suffering is attachment and aversion. The second noble truth, what are we attached to in our communication? How do we respond when someone shares suffering, a painful experience with us, what do we usually say? Do we try to brush it off? Do we try to just mention silver lining and say, well, at least you were not hit by a car today. You're telling me this story, you survived. So would that be uh, acknowledging suffering, holding the suffering of another being? Uh, so what are we attached to? Are we attached to feeling comfortable? I am going to invite you in this time that we have together to uh, let go of that attachment. And what's our aversion when we hear pain? When you might hear people of color and especially our, uh, the Black members of our human family talking about racism, talking about oh, this is an issue of racism again and again and again and again. Do we have any aversion to hearing that, to listening to that? What do we do with that? And of course, we know from the third novel truth that there is a way out of suffering. So how can we listen to our friends of color in a way that can invite whoever is suffering, especially people of color, out of suffering in the moment that they're with us. And the way out of suffering, the fourth noble truth, is to follow the noble eightfold path. We're also going to talk about, and within this eight noble, the noble eightfold path, there is the notion, the third one is wise speech, which is part of wise action or skillful speech or Sometimes it's called right speech, but because my focus is on language and communication, and I actually take language very seriously because I know how it shapes our lives and our experience of our lives and our relationships, then I'm going to be using the word wise or skillful rather than right. Because if we 
use the word right, from my perspective, it puts us back in that binary um, place that Mimi so eloquently shared with us last, last week. So I'm going to be using the word wise or skillful. And I love the word wise because, and you know, this is the wise action series, because the root of the word wise is the same root as the, as the word wild. So when we are in our wild nature, in our unconditioned nature, we have wisdom. We can call in that, ver that inner quality, intrinsic quality of wisdom. So you might have heard of the paramitas and, and depending on which school of Buddhism, you know, sometimes it might be called the paramis in um, Pali or the paramitas in Sanskrit. And some say there are six and some say there are 10 and some say there are more. Um, so in Vajrayana Buddhism, we usually talk about the 10 paramitas, but we're going to be focusing maybe uh, mainly on generosity. So we're going to be working on the Four Noble Truths and Dana or generosity. Okay, so when we talk about skillful speech, when we hear about skillful speech, and it's interesting because I, um, since I think I was about five, I started um, just uh, driving my parents crazy with questions about language. Why do we say this? And who decided that this was the way we were going to call green? And why? Who said that yes is yes and no is no? And and, and did, did you learn that somewhere? And, and, and why was that person inventing those words? And can we invent words? So in my family, we did have lots of made up words. And uh, that we would invade, invent throughout the years about different experiences. But usually when we talk about skillful speech or we hear a Dharma talk about skillful speech or we work on skillful speech, we talk about speaking, about what happens from our lips out there. And I am going to invite you to, this is gonna be part two, September 8th, we're gonna do part two. What happens, how do we use language to communicate externally but today we're going to be focusing on listening, which is actually the first language skill. So the, in language, we have four skills. We have listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And the first skill that we develop as human beings when we come to the world with the ability to communicate with one another is to listen. Some babies spend uh, 10 months listening, some babies spend 18 months listening, some babies spend 30, 36 months listening before they say something out loud. So we are in, in our unconditioned state. What we do is listen. And as we get more and more conditioned, we start to talk more and then we start to relate to one another using words. And sometimes we forget to listen, which was the first skill that we came to the world with. So today we're going to focus on listening. And this is going to be a very interactive, even though I have a little presentation here, uh, this is going to be interactive. But you know, I used to be a teacher, so I can't help it, no Moses. <laughs> Um, I'm still a teacher, but I'm, I'm not teaching uh, young ones or, you know, uh, yes, I'm not, I'm not in a particular school teaching. So I like to, we're going to go into a group and I like to invite you to think about, you know, the first noble truth, there is suffering, there's pain. I like to invite you to think about a time when you shared something painful with someone could have been anything and you did not feel heard. We're gonna put you in pairs or um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six. If you participate, no, then, then you can all do this. And uh, you can keep me in the wherever, wherever you'd like to keep me. <laughs> so think about 
an experience where you shared something with someone, something that was painful to you and you didn't feel heard and ask each other these questions. And we're just going to have a total of five minutes. So keep track of maybe two and a half minutes per person. What let you know you were not heard? How did it feel in your body? And what thoughts did you have that let you know that you were not heard? So before, um, before we do this, I want to say two things. When you decide to ask, allow yourself to um, invite a sense of openness and presence to be with this incredibly beautiful gift that you have in front of your screen who's another human being and when and ask those questions and when they're done simply say thank you and then you switch so we're not going to have dialogue of commenting i can't believe this is what happened to you we're not going to do that or we're we're not going to say well give me the number of that person i'm going to call them and let them know that that was not skillful we're not going to do that either we're just simply going to ask these three questions. And when our partner answers, we're going to say thank you. And then we're going to switch. For talking? Yes. Over talking. I was told I was sensitive, too sensitive. Mm. So what was that like? How did you know that you were not heard? Let's, let's mention them, popcorn style. Mm -hmm. Uh, over. Labeling you. This is who you are. Calling you, telling you who you are. Yeah. The person changing the subject. Oh, evading. Okay. Yes. Body language, facial expression. Ah, uh, who said that, Jenny? No, Diane. No. Diane. Yes. And, and do you um, recall any specific body language or facial expressions? I do. It looked like the life was getting sucked out of her. <sighs> so the person was shutting down? Yeah, didn't want to hear it or and that mm -hmm. it made me feel really bad. So I never talk about painful things to that person. Also, another time just said something stupid so that thing face body i did for everybody things everyone said and then just also just saying something stupid and minimizing yes minimizing it and saying something stupid mm -hmm. yeah like this is not important this is not painful mm -hmm. like a, oh yeah. my my uh, so and so had this thing that's not anything like your illness and uh they did fine but wait no then they, they didn't so go for those checkups <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, exactly. So, you know, we're talking about how listening uh, belongs to space and actually in, um, in Ayurveda, which is translated as the science of life, the everything is made of five elements and listening corresponds to the element of space. So when we take take the spotlight and and someone is sharing something painful and we say oh that's nothing let me tell you how it was for me or for somebody else we take the space mm -hmm. so there is no space for the other person we abandon the other person what else do we um let you know in your experience that you are not heard heard Impatience. Hmm. How so? Interruption or? Yeah, kind of bitchiness. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. What did bitchiness look like in that moment? What did, I'm sorry, what did what? Bitchiness look like in that moment. Just being cut short, just being short and curt and just like, just there was no space. So, you know, pull back. Right. Retreat. Mm, yes. Retreat, pull back again. There's no space, cutting it short. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So anything else that we want to share? 
in my case, uh, the experience I was sharing with Mimi was just getting a lot of advice and uh, and telling me uh, what to do and how to see the other person and how to see them as wrong or bad. And, and I was hurting sharing that I had lost my best friend when I was seven years old and, oh, the other person's to blame. And so you shouldn't feel this way. And all these things so yeah so this is sometimes what we do what we have learned from generation generations and generations on how to listen to one another which actually is not listening because if listening is connected to the element of space then what we need to do when we listen is to offer space but instead the uh, what is communicated here in when we don't listen is there is no space for you. You are not safe to share your experience. And what's also uh, when there's a, a person of color sharing something with us and having the vulnerability and the courage to come to a person who may not identify as a person of color or may not be a person of color is um, that then if they don't feel heard, and I'm going to show this little screen again, is the message that we get is you are here with me. So then the person of color needs to adapt and adjust to us again and again, and again. And all we're doing is you are here with me, me who has no patience, me who's going to tell you who you are, me who's going to tell you what to do and give you advice, me who's going to label you, me who's going to talk louder than you, who's going to talk over you, me who's going to have the power and the privilege to change the subject make a joke about it, uh, make it light, say, oh, that doesn't happen to you. So how does this, how do I hear this again and again when I, a person of color, share something with uh, something painful that has happened to me? I might hear it, what I hear back is, oh, you shouldn't complain that much because at least you're not black or you pass. Come on, Alejandro, you pass. Um, I have heard in many sanghas that I have belonged to. Finally, diversity has arrived. Um, when oh I have come into the into a beautiful group of kind hearted people who want to awaken to their essence nature for the benefit of all beings. I'm not making this up. Or if I share something, what I hear is, well, I get exactly how you feel because I am a white woman working in a man's field. So all these things, or I get what you feel because, let me tell you what happened to my friend that's even worse than that. And so what this conveys is, okay, now I have to hold space for the other person. I have to listen to the other person. I have to once again, adapt and adjust to the other person because oh, I need to remember that as we have all inherited this world of white supremacy that says that those who have fair skin are um, have more privilege and uh, more rights and are superior and more intelligent and more beautiful and uh, more capable and great leaders and all the wonderful adjectives that you can think of. Oh, I need to remember I am here with you, right? You can't be with me because listening conveys a very different message. 
listening doesn't convey the message of you are here with me, so listen to what I have to say after you told me your painful story. Comments, questions, objections, they're all welcome. I do I have, have a question. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Go ahead, Diane. I've been learning about microaggression. Yes. And I've, I've heard my friends of color, you know, just tell me some of the stupid things. And I know maybe that's not a very sophisticated word, stupid, but the stupid things, un, unthoughtful, unkind, disregarding kind of things that people say to them. And some are more subtle than others. And so I've been thinking about like, these are my, these are, these are what microaggressions are. Yes. It seems like they're macro. Yes, sometimes they're macro and my, microaggressions, when you hear them, they are like death by a thousand nicks. You know, they keep hurting and hurting and hurting. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll share with you the second question I get asked after I say my name is, where are you from? Oh, how did you learn English? And, um, and then within, I would say the five top questions I get asked if I mention by any chance that I'm married or someone sees that I wear a wedding ring says, oh, so did your husband come with you? I'm like, um, no, he's a New Yorker. And, you know, um, no, he did. Uh, so the assumption is, of course, you are with someone who is of your kind, your other. Yeah. Yes. Mimi, you had a question or a comment? Yeah. One of the things that I've been trying to wrap my head around as I've been doing a lot of reading, as you guys know, if you were in my class last week, yeah. <laughs> um, is how intentions play into this. And it's, it's so complex. It's a very complex situation, I realize. And, um, and I think the thing that I've sort of come to the conclusion that because, of course, in Buddhism, you know, the Buddha said intentions are everything. Mm -hmm. And that you have no control over the results of your actions, right? And this is also what yoga says, right? Yeah. Yeah. But how does wise action fit into that? And, you know, the thing I came to the conclusion, it's like, okay. Um, but again, you have to be like aware that you have this interest in understanding and improving yourself, right? To become educated, right? Which was what I was trying to get to. Um, but still, there are going to be times when people's intentions are true yet they still have a level of ignorance because of many reasons many reasons and i know that there is a sense a great sense of fatigue in the community many communities within the umbrella of people of color and i totally yeah. resonate with that which i think is what you were just speaking to mm -hmm. it's like what is your recommendation to people um, white people who may stick their foot in their mouth a gazillion times before they get it right. Yes, and guess what? We will all, we all will. We will. So that idea that we're going to be perfect every time we communicate, um, we're human. And as human, we have limitations. And every time we put our foot in our mouth, it's an opportunity to wake up. It's an opportunity, just like when we're meditating and we are lost embedded in thought, it's an opportunity to say, oh, I can come back to myself. So yes, we have intention and we also have impact. So we're going to talk actually about that in part two. Okay, oh great. About intention and impact. Because the intention of someone who says, oh, where are you from? Or did your husband, or how did you learn to speak English? Or did your husband uh, come with you? The underlying intention is an intention to connect. The impact is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's, I find that to be one of the most um, difficult and complex issues 
around speech and listening and all of that stuff. So I'm glad you're going yeah. to be going into that a little bit yeah. more. Thank you. Yes, and be, uh, you know, I am delighted to hear you're reading a lot. So when you say, oh, I'm reading a lot, say, I am reading a lot. You know, I'm <laughs> I am, I lot. love reading. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, can, I can tell you love reading from your class last week. And let's just all claim that there is so much we don't know. That's a truth. There's so much we don't know and so much we can learn every moment. So let's not begrudge being learners. Let's be open to learning again and again and again. As I said, I don't usually say of myself, I'm an expert in language and communication. I usually say I'm a student of language and communication because I'm devoted to the study of language and communication as it relates to consciousness. And I'll be until my last breath. Will I ever become an expert? I don't know, maybe in my last breath or maybe in the next life, who knows? But for now, I am a student. So let's, um, we're gonna put you in another group, but this time we are going to talk about, and uh, I put it here, think about an experience when you shared something painful and you with someone and you did feel heard. So again, what lets you know that you were heard? How did it feel in your body? And what thoughts did you have? So think about that. When you were heard, how did it feel in your body? What lets you know that you were heard? And what thoughts did you have? And you don't necessarily have to share what happened. You don't have to share the context unless it's like a headliner or else you can get lost in the context just like we get lost in thought when we're meditating. So just share the headliner if you want and just go more into the awareness. This is what I wanna invite you to connect more deeply with. How do you know when you're heard? Because the more you know the, how you're heard and how it feels in your body, the more you will know how to communicate with other and hold space for another person when they share something painful. Okay? So, Noam, are you going to put us in groups again? And again, five minutes, no more than that. Thank you. Were some experiences that let you know that you were heard? What did others do? I think Noam, you're you're nodding and and smiling. Shall we uh, unmute you? <laughs> well, it was interesting, but it was uh, you know I don't know what we would have said if that had been the first question because it seemed like we all were very much taking on that idea of space, like it felt spacious and we saw or an openness, oh not yet. <laughs> You're having an influence on us. <laughs> yeah, we talked, we all talked yeah. about an openness and, and, uh, yeah. and a sort of a, like, it's okay to keep going. Kind of. mm. Yeah, so kind of like the message was one of capacity, like you got connected to your capacity. It's okay to keep going my group we've mm -hmm. talked about it's going to be okay or i can resolve this yeah anything else that came up for you ray let me take a uh, um restating or re re-emphasizing what you spoke you know re repeating it back to you kind of letting you know that you were heard that way yes and do you know why that, that allows us to feel heard? Do you know? Do you have, yeah? When someone says the words that you said? Yeah. Why? Because so many people just nod or uh, try to give advice rather than letting you know, you know, that, that they heard the words that you've actually spoken. <laughs> Yes, that's part of it. And also because the words that of all the words in the English language, if you if this interaction was in English, you chose particular words to convey your experience. 
like right now you said some, you know, a lot of people nod or give you a lot of advice. What if I had said to you, yes, a lot of people make movements with their heads or they tell you what you should do about it. It's not the same. It doesn't resonate the same. It doesn't have, because words have an energetic resonance. And so when we offer those words back as a gift, because we were present, we are connecting in the same, at the same energetic level with another human being. Thank you. Thank you, Raheem. Anybody else? I was going to say the thing that came to mind first to me was I was able to let go. Yes. I was able to let go. And that's, I mean, it's so interesting because it relates so strongly, I think, to my meditation practice is that when I'm able to let go, that's an opening into space. And there, when somebody listens to you, it's like, you can let go because you don't have to put forth an effort to help them hear you, right? It's like, it kind of, it, you can just sit back and like, you know, a sigh of relief. There's like, whew, that kind of like, yeah, it's this, it's a real kind of, um, it's very spacious. Yeah spacious relief and that letting go that, uh, yes, you talked about in our group. And how many of you felt safe? Oh, I, I feel safe with this person. Letting this person know my experience, all of you. Okay. And Diane, was there anything you wanted to say before when, when Ray was going to speak? No, I, I, um, it's kind of what, what everyone else said and just, um, I felt listened to because the body language that they're looking at me and they're not doing anything else. And there's, I sense like presence and they weren't, and just the way I felt just relief. And mm -hmm. the instant I thought just the, the relief of being able to um, have this person there and they helped, it just felt so good to have that person to talk to. I can't even describe it. Such a beautiful gift of presence. Mm -hmm. And thank that you for someone that. Was able to talk. Thank you for connecting that to generosity and the practice of generosity. It is when we're able to be present with another human being, mm -hmm. when we're able to really listen, we are very generous with them. We're practicing dana with our fellow members of our human family. And when we do that, the message that we convey is very different than um, than, than the previous message we talked about. But this message is, I am here with you. Not you are here with me, but I am here with you. So in that sense, offering that space with openness, with generosity, with presence, acknowledging, yes, there is suffering and you are coming here to me to take refuge in me to share this particular suffering that you're going through or you just went through. I want to offer to all of you, if we want to be mature spiritual practitioners who are living the Dharma, who are really following the Eightfold Path, then we need to learn to become a stable refuge for people of color. We need to become that safe space so that we can shift what's going on right now. And there can be healing. Some of you, I mean, even uh, Mimi said she left, she felt less pain. She was sharing about the pain, something physical pain, and she felt less pain. So when we're able to become a refuge for our family members of color, then they can decrease that feeling of pain. And I'm saying they right now, but I'll use they and we interchangeably. But when we become a refuge to people of color, then we can also help people of color tap into their incredible capacity. 
and that can bring healing to the whole world. So let's look here at some of the, of the uh, skills that we can cultivate to listen wisely, to listen skillfully. So I want to uh, stop my video for a moment and show you something that I love to show. So I'm going to write here on my little board the word Can anybody read that word? What does it say? Yeah, I hear you. Listen. 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 Yes. Yeah, so now let's take this S and let's take this I and this L and this E and this N and this C. Listen is silent. So if we want to become a refuge to our siblings, our cousins, our aunts and uncles, our parents, our ancestors, um, who are people of color or identify as people of color, are, are black, then we need to be silent. And we need to avoid jumping in, interrupting, talking over, letting them know this is who you are, or that's because you're too this, too sensitive, too loud, too quiet. And we also need to learn energetically to be in our belly and our hearts. When you are able to listen from the belly, remember in the meditation, I invited you to bring your awareness and to listen to your belly center, two or three fingers above or below the belly button. When you are able to be energetically in your belly, there's nothing that feels too much. So we can listen without collapsing. We can listen without falling into despair. We can listen without becoming so empathic that then we don't know what to do with ourselves. Or we can listen without getting lost in anger or rage. This is how we learn to become stable, by bringing our awareness to our belly centers, breathing in and out of the belly, and this is how we can listen to any painful thing. I listen to painful experiences all day long when I'm coaching my clients, couples, when I'm working with groups. That's what I do all day long. I would not be able to be energetically, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually strong if I were not in my belly. And as I share with many people, it took me three years to learn what that meant and practice and go on retreats where all we did on the retreat was to be in our bellies, listen from the belly, speak from the belly. Our voice sounds different. We have a sense of capacity because the belly is the center of presence and the center of capacity and the center of strength. And then we need to be able to listen with our hearts because our hearts are a center of compassion and our center of generosity and our center of connection. After we listen to someone who shared a, a painful experience with us, we need to be able to say thank you, appreciate them for having the courage to share pain and suffering with us for taking refuge in us. And all we need to do, we don't even, we don't even need to say thanks for sharing. We just, we could just say a very generous, genuine thank you. And we can reflect back, as Ray was saying, using the same words, and I shared with you why. And then we can offer empathy. And by offering empathy, we can simply reply with, 
Wow. That sounds hard. Tell me more. Wow. Um, body language. Ah, thank you. Is there anything else you want me to know about this? Silent, space, generosity, openness. Thank you. And as I offer empathy, empathy is not telling the other person, you are so strong, so you can go through this with great strength and uh, fortitude and resilience. Empathy is about being able to say, you know, I'm wondering how exactly this was for you. Empathy is accompanying another person in their journey of their own experience and with curiosity and openness, kindness and compassion and warmth, wanting to know more. So how did you feel? How was that in your body? Oh, I see you. I hear that this was hard for you. Wow. Yeah, I'm really getting right now how how difficult this was for you or how um, how infuriating you were. Of course you were infuriated. That, that was an infuriating experience. That's all we're doing. We are not saying, I am sorry you had this experience because telling someone I am sorry you had this experience is not empathy. It is sympathy. It is telling the other person Yep, you are the victim and others are oppressors. So just simply say, wow, yeah, I get that was painful. Thank you for telling me. And then we can say, what would you like from me? How can I support you? Again, offering space, listening more, being more and more generous. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. And again, I'm going to ask you for questions, comments, objections, anything that's coming up for you right now. I have a question. I've noticed that sometimes I have a hard time listening. Um, I will speak in order to take up space as a way of feeling safe when I'm yeah. feeling threatened. And I don't Thank always you. know why I'm feeling threatened except, you know, but I'm just wondering, this is something I've been aware of in general or increasingly aware of. And I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to work with yes. that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So sometimes we feel threatened when, um, when we are in our bodies or when we're not in our bodies. So the first inquiry for you would be to become aware of whether that threatening sensation comes when you are in your body or when you are not in your body. So if you notice that feeling threatened is when you're not in your body, take a breath into the belly because that belly is your refuge your center of presence, of stability, and safety. Uh, remember I said it took me three years to learn what that meant? When you are able to be and abide in the belly center, that's when you, and when I understood what the Buddhists mean when they say diamond nature, you are truly indestructible. You don't take things personally. You don't, you don't feel scared. Uh, so that, that could be the antidote of learning how to be in your belly. But first now, notice if being in your body is threatening or unthreatening. So if being outside of your body, if you feel like you're going to fall apart and you're going to, you know, you're shaky and um, then bring yourself back into your body. Be in your belly, learn to be in the belly, breathe in and out of the belly, put your hands on your belly, bring yourself back. And then just, you can say to yourself, I'm here with myself. I'm safe right here with myself. I'm taking refuge 
in myself. And then you can open up the space for the other person to share. If on the contrary, you feel that being some of us, because of previous experiences, feel unsafe to be in the body. So if you feel unsafe in your body, notice the environment that you're in, the earth holding you, and take refuge in that. So you might notice right now, there's the earth supporting me. Right now, there's a bird flying. It is safe. There's no tiger coming to eat me or, you know, not, there's not a piano that's going to fall on my feet, on my head. So um, right now, I see someone smiling that just came back. So you take refuge in that, and then you will learn how to come back to your body safely. What is that like for you to hear that, Kenya? I, I'm digesting it. I think. Yeah. I think it's a lot to digest. I think that I think that there really is something to that because. I think that not being in my body has been a survival mechanism. And so it's, so that's, so that's really interesting. Um, but generally speaking, it, it goes along with what I'm learning in general in my spiritual path, which is, has to do with getting out of the story and into something that's, that is either, I mean, from what I'm hearing you say, it's either something that's real in here or something that's real in here. Is that right? Yes. Yes. You know, in alchemy, we say is within, so without. As above, so below. So, um, yes. And I, I have learned these practices from uh, two of my dear teachers, John Wellwood and Jennifer Wellwood, who bridged Western psychology with Eastern spiritualities, uh, both uh, Dzogchen and Vajrayana Buddhism and uh, tantric practices from India. So, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. You can spend time lying down on the, on the floor, not on your bed. That will give you a sense of connection with safety with the earth. Yeah, you can do meditations lying down on the floor, not on the bed. The bed we fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else before we move forward? Okay. Are we done? No? Is it nine? We're, it's almost nine. We're almost done. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, we almost are. I didn't even realize. Um, okay. And I, I sort of had a comment earlier that I didn't say, and I thought, well, I'll wait and maybe say it later. But if we are toward the end, maybe I'll say it now, which is, I just want to acknowledge, Alejandra, that as a person of color, and I know you and I have talked about how that's not something you've always considered yourself. And yeah. you're making a distinction between black people and other people of color, and you're kind of shifting back and forth between the two. But I just want to acknowledge that your generosity as a teacher is remarkable, but in particular, as a person of color speaking to a bunch of white people, I'm making an assumption here that all of us identify as white, is, is really uh, very touching and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, Thank you. I, I, yeah, I appreciate you so much. Thank you, yes. And I keep making that distinction intentionally because uh, we have, you know, the, even the term, I mean, there, there are many scholars that talk about what is uh, BIPOC or BIPOC or POC or person of color or people of color. And again, it's that um, very human ability and habit that we have of categorizing 
everything, including human beings and categorizing. And so I want to make the distinction again and again of um, there are similarities between uh, amongst the experience of different people who have uh, different ethnic groups and cultural backgrounds and understanding of the world and beliefs and religions and um, and skin color and different facial features and, and physical traits. And there's also a, a distinct experience for the members, and I keep calling it our human family, as the Black members of our human family. I don't know what it is like to be a Black member of this human family. I'm not a Black woman. I have heard from many of my Black siblings how different the experience is because in this country we have anti-Blackness. So we need to call it out. And we need to learn to be comfortable with it. That's what it is. That's, that's the truth. As someone who is an immigrant, and uh, came to the United States and chose to become a citizen of the United States, which was a very, uh, a very uh, painful, long, emotional, painful process to make that decision. I felt like I was betraying my family. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was betraying my, um, my the, the country of origin that educated me and gave me so much. And if you ever go to a citizenship uh, ceremony, it's very interesting. But at some point, um, you are asked, at least when I became a citizen, which was uh, when we had President Obama in the White House, we were asked to stand up to consider our ancestors, what we have learned, and to leave that behind. And to now become a citizen of this country and vow to bear arms and kill if needed to protect this country. It was a very uh, hard decision. There was not one person in that citizenship ceremony who wasn't crying. We were all crying. Even though I had been here uh, for, I don't know, like over 10 years, um, 12 years or something like that. Um, so having become a citizen of the United States, I also acknowledge the karma that is related to that and my commitment to learn about the history of the United States and continue to educate myself. This is why whatever you have donated and whenever you come to any workshop that I teach, a percentage of what I receive I donated to Facing History and Ourselves. It is an organization that I'm very proud to support and be a member of the advisory board in the Bay Area. And it's an organization that teaches teachers to, um, because 85% of our teachers in the United States are white, to understand intolerance and to challenge white supremacy and understand how to talk about it with compassion and face ourselves so that we understand that the choices we make now impact history, impact the future, and increase our, we call it our universe of responsibility. Who are we responsible for? So just know that we, whatever you have contributed, it's contributing to children too who are going to learn how to speak up intolerance. Yes, Jenny? Can the link to that organization be put in the chat? Yes, to... it's uh, facinghistory.org. And as we leave here today, I would like to encourage you to uh, have some sankalpa, some, some intention, as Mimi was mentioning the word intention. What are you willing to do? You know, it's very powerful. Uh, it's and ourselves, facing history and ourselves. 
and um, there are lots of workshops that any teacher can take online uh, for free and they're constantly putting uh, new materials. But what is something that um, you are willing to, to do as a result of what you've heard, what's present with you today? And uh, just unmute yourself and let's share that. And if someone shares, let's all listen with openness and generosity. Um, I, uh, what, a word that came up for me today in, uh, in, in, in work, the, the, the thing I want to work on is that I convey patience when I, when I'm listening to someone in general, right, but in particular to a person of color, that I'm not, that I make it that I really cultivate patience when I'm listening to them. Thank you. That word patience again, right, in every class. And it's one of the paramitas. And of course, the patience has the same root as the word passion, which has the root, same root as the word pain. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I'm totally committed to listening uh, in a way that is um, more spacious. And um, I'm also committed to sharing as much of what I'm learning through my own research so that others can um, blossom their own self-discovery of where they are in this um, sort of cultural milieu that we all find ourselves in. And it's so complex. And um, I think locating ourselves is really important. And so if I can facilitate that for others, um, um, that's definitely a commitment I can make for sure. Thank you, Mimi. Well, I commit to um, the skillful listening slide. I hope it's okay. I made a photo just so I can take some notes. I'm not going to post it or anything, but just commit to really these good ideas that will help me be a better presence when people are talking and to not, you know, be guilty of microaggressions inadvertently. And um, so just thank you for this. And, and never thought about listening from my belly because I think that's going to help give me patience. Because sometimes, you know, people or um, I work, I'm listening to people and there's this kind of like, not hurry, but it's not natural to go, yeah, let's just kick back and listen. But I'm working with organizations now that are really effective and it's no secret they're doing the most amazing work because part of their culture of the organization is really listening to people, taking the time and listening. People come, tell their stories that gives them their programming and they're so successful. I think there's a magic to really being, just being with people and being with them. It's a beautiful gift of generosity, be with people and be with them. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Uh, I can commit to, um, well, to two things. One is my ongoing journey of um, seeking, seeking safety or, or w within myself yeah. so that I can create space, you know, so, so that I can also be there for others. Um, but it, I, I think what I got from this was that I, I'm still just learning how to create that space for myself or, 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 and I'm learning to do that. And specifically, I'm I'm excited to um, commit to meditating lying down. 
<laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I'll go next. I commit to um, listening with curiosity because by opening the space and listening, inevitably, I'm curious and want to know more. And uh, so, yeah. Diane, I know that because at work, I'm like that. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And, um, and when I do just take a step back, then a curious mind, you know, the, the space allows for curiosity. So thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. You are so welcome, Jackie. And I think we have Ray. Um, I think my main uh, takeaway and uh, what I commit to is uh, pausing a little more before responding. Um, and also pausing before I think about what I'm going to say. <laughs> Because sometimes um, we get into the habit of thinking about what we're going to say before they're finished. And so I think taking a moment, pausing, and just making space for that and not feeling that urge to, to have to say something. It seems like you are doing that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to just share one last time. It's like we're going to have part two on September 8th, where we're going to talk about how do we speak skillfully, not just mm. uh, after we've listened, what do we say uh, as we're talking about intention and impact how do we repair the bond when uh, when we notice that we were unskillful yeah. how do we communicate with others and how do we stand up to talk about uh, microaggressions macroaggressions racism how do we bring that up so um, you can also find some blog posts about how to listen to others and painful experiences and kind of like the process at languagealchemy.com there's I think it's like how to listen with compassion or something I can't remember what the blog post is but you can you can listen to that there and if you do want this uh, presentation I'll email it to you you can put the email on the chat and I will email it to you thank you so much oh Lechusa. thank you so much you're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Let's take a moment together. Let's just take a breath into our bellies, into our hearts. And let's all listen with openness, spaciousness, kindness. Let us become the refuge for others. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again. <laughs>